the end of luxury. Yet another episode in our ongoing series. Oh, how fun, <laughs> especially now at the end of 2024 and the forecast for the next couple of years is looking slim, grim, and brim -a -lim -a -lim. And now it seems as though the luxury brands have forsaken and forgotten and ignored and snobbed and snubbed Gen Zers for far too long. And it seems as though there is no remedy. It seems as though it might just be too late. Well, let's get to it. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Push the join button next to the subscription button. Become a member today. Gain access to extra perks. You can also join me on Patreon. Super day of all spelled together there as well for extra perks. This video is being filmed live in front of a live virtual audience. I live stream several times a week, so come join the fun, come join the chats. Everything I say in this video is for entertainment purposes only, not rooted in truths or facts. Facts, chats, a little rhyme. But subscribe, we're almost at 100,000 subbies. Come on, let's get the party started. You guys, there's a ton of articles online just this week, one of them from the Business Insider, saying that luxury brands forgot about Gen Z and they can't afford to make that mistake again. And so... I've been reading this article and then another three popped up and they all have the same topic. Um, and I'm like thinking about it. I'm like, huh. So why are, why is Gen Z not shopping for luxury anymore? And there's, according to this article, several reasons. They say Gen Z could account for nearly a third of luxury purchases by 2030. And so uh, Bain reports uh, a company. And then, so the first people to shop at Hermes are long gone, says this article. I'm thinking to myself, what are you talking about? Hermes is the only luxury company that is actually still making profits, like plus growth in 2024 in the third quarter. But the first people to shop at Hermes are long gone might mean when the company opened over 100 years ago. Like those customers from over 100 years ago, they might be gone. Yeah, they kicked the bucket. I get it. But like now, the clients that were shopping for Hermes back in the day when Samantha Jones of Sex in the City starred in that, well, Kim Cattrall starred in the episode. But when Samantha Jones wanted that Birkin, oh, so bad. And the guy selling the Birkin in the Hermes store told her it's like, what, four or $5,000. Now we laugh at that price. Um, and then Lucy Liu had to pay the price, but then Lucy Liu ended up with the Birkin and Samantha Jones ended up with mm, pasta in her face. You know, the client that was buying a Birkin back then, that client might not be gone yet. So what are we talking about here? You know. And the article also says, long are also gone the clients that used to shop at Louis Vuitton and Prada. Yet the brands still exist because their ultimate goal is to continuously train new generations to fall in love with luxury. I see. But now it appears that some luxury brands have forgotten that aim. After the pandemic, luxury players took their eye off the ball with Gen Z. A generation Bain and Company estimates could account for nearly a third of all luxury purchases by 2030. Industry experts say brands took advantage of inflation by hiking prices and heavily focused on their wealthiest clients with very important people experiences, VIP experiences, essentially putting aspirational consumers on the back burner. Two years later, the strategy seems to have backfired, shrinking the luxury customer base by 50 million customers. Now, first when I read, sorry, something like, first when I read this article, I thought, wait, are they talking about 50 million dollars or 50 million customers? Because yeah, 50 million dollars for a single individual might be a lot, but for the fashion industry, 50 million dollars is peanuts. But then no. I looked into it, and what the article means is 50 million clients. That's a lot, you guys. If we're talking 50 million people, that's more than $50 million. Believe it or not. I know that a lot of people out there think that money's worth more than a human's life, but no, truth be told, it isn't. And it might, you might have to learn that the hard way, but you will, by hook or by crook. So here's the thing. Thumb up the video and subscribe.
Anyway, we'll go, we'll go. Uh, there's been a kind of refocusing, probably an overcorrection of the strategy to focus on the top of the pyramid that was more resilient in a moment of turbulence. Claudia D'Arpizio, senior partner and global head of fashion and luxury at Bain, told Business Insider. Luxury brands aim to stay forever. Blanca Zugasa Escribano, a fashion and luxury consultant at Matisse, said, But to do that, brands need to keep an eye on both sides of the business, she added, and that includes winning back Gen Z through decisive strategy shifts, creative partnerships, and affordable luxury. And then they call, then they talk about training the next generation. And this is where I have a huge problem with, but I've been telling you this since forever. Brands rely on brand marketing and to sell and to grow and to grow their reputation, to grow their heritage, to grow their sense of just, to consolidate the sense of worth in the eyes of the consumer so that the consumer respects them and that the consumer really believes that these brands rightfully belong on the throne of whatever commerce situation they're in, right? So here's the thing. Training the next generation. Darpizio said that the that to get Gen Z back on board, luxury brands must adopt a high-low strategy, part of which entails releasing affordable products that appeal to younger aspirational consumers and their core clientele, fragrance, beauty, and eyewear, categories that have shown resilience through the industry-wide slowdown could be key to this strategy. But here's what I have an issue with, and this is what I was telling you earlier that I've been talking about for years now, is I don't like that these brand marketing strategies are all focused on indoctrinating the next generations of clientele, meaning letting you, the potential future customer, when you are very young, making you desire luxury, getting you exposed to, to that artificial inflated desirability that goes with luxury. In other words, they make you desire luxury so that when you grow up, you already have that seed planted in you and you kind of get indoctrinated into accepting the fact that you're going to spend a ton of money for luxury because you're going to feel like if everybody else around you is doing so to showcase their worth and social status. So that means that also you need to do the same. And you grow up thinking that and being taught that. And at a certain point, at a certain age, you're going to completely be brainwashed to think, yeah, I, sure, yes, of course, I need to buy this as well uh, if I want to make it in society, if I want to be someone in society. That's indoctrination. Brand marketing is key in that. So they're thinking about, and in fact, they're using that terminology, training the next generation. In its most recent earning results, LVMH reported that perfumes and cosmetics delivered the strongest growth across sectors in quarter three, up 3%. This division was up 5% from the uh, first nine months of 2024 compared to the previous year. And I'm like, LVMH selling their perfumes well? No, I don't believe that. Dior? Yes, because LVMH uh, owns Dior, not just Louis Vuitton. So that Dior perfumes are selling very well, especially because of their Collection Privé collect, uh, perfume range. I can see that. And also their makeup and skincare. That I can see. But to say that Louis Vuitton's perfumes are selling that well? Okay. Well, you mean, sure. I'll, I'll take your word for it. You know what I mean? Uh, meanwhile, Caring's beauty and eyewear divisions were also one of the few highlights from its own latest earnings, delivering 7% same-store sales growth in quarter three of 2024. Jamie Ray, the CEO of Buttermilk, a marketing agency that works with luxury brands, said his company's work uh, to help launch Prada's beauty range in the U.S. this year through nano influencers on TikTok, coupled with Sabrina Carpenter whipping out one of its lip balms in a music video, is a prime example of how brands can and should try to resonate with Gen Z. Really? Sabrina Carpenter? You need Sabrina Carpenter to whip out a Prada lippy in one of her music clips? in order to resonate with Gen Z? Sabrina Carpenter. Okay. 
possibly the person who wrote this article or the person who's doing the brand marketing is not Gen Z. Now, the broader issue I think every luxury fashion house or conglomerate has is we can't sell a $5,000 handbag to a 21-year-old, he said, but we can sell a lip oil or we can sell foundation and they still get some sort of emotional attachment. You see? How sneaky, how sneaky oh, and conniving they are from the brand marketing. They're like, we want to hook you. We want you to get an emotional attachment to the brand. Buy a little something, little trinket that you can afford with the logo on it. Like this little Chanel tweezer. That comes, by the way, you can't buy this singularly. It comes in a in an eyebrow palette. But you know what I mean? Like, oh, look, you got a little Chanel tweezer. Now you're hooked. Now, when you grow up and have some more money, you will be spending those $10,000 on a bag because it all started with a pair of tweezers, honey. Boo-boo cha. Not only do affordable products align with Gen Z's current spending power, but they can develop lasting brand loyalty, which Escribano said will pay off long term. That little piece of luxury that you're carrying with you is already building you into a potential future customer. If you ever have the means to actually purchase the products that are aimed at the higher net worth customer, she said. Teresa says in the chat, that's how I started when I was younger. It was cosmetics. There you go. There you go. Tyler says, okay, but I do love my Chanel tweezer. I love mine as well. But we're, we're the sucker. Ty, Ty, we are the sucker. We are the victims. We have been sucked into this and indoctrinated. It's too late for us. The pods have taken over. There's no hope for our generation, Ty, but there might be hope for, you know, the next generation of the kids coming up. And in fact, this is an interesting point because it seems as though the younger generation is finally realizing maybe, you know, the climate being ruined is really a thing. Maybe the kids of the kids of our kids are not going to have a planet anymore that's livable. No more water. No more food. You're going to have to eat insects like Nicole Kidman. You're going to suck up a worm and a cockroach on a TV show. She loves doing it, by the way. Just go check out, uh, check it out on YouTube. Type in Nicole Kidman eating bugs. Okay, so that's where we're at. Snowpiercer will become reality. That's where it's at. But um, so the kids are realizing, well, it's, uh, yeah, okay. For us, it's too late. Forget about it. I'm I'm the sucker, you know? Yeah, give me, yeah, $10,000. Birkin bag, yeah, sure. Want it, love it, love it. Awesome. Yeah, not ashamed to say it. But I am worried for the future generations. And I think they're waking up and they're realizing, hold on a minute, we don't need all of this. Maybe we need clean water. <laughs> Maybe we should prioritize clean water. Maybe we should prioritize, like, having a home, being able to afford buying a home, having a shelter. I just watched a video the other day that blew my mind. It is so simple in its structure. It's this chick. She's doing like, I don't know if it was a TikTok or an Instagram reel, whatever. And she's like saying like, okay, so to make me, I needed a mother and a father. But to make my mother and father, they needed a mother and a father each. So that's two people to make me, four people to make them, eight people to make those people, 16 people to make those people, 32 people to make those people. So she goes back and back and back until she reaches, I think, 4,000 people. And she says, look, this is just, this is like 200 years of my family tree. And we are 4,000 people. And yet, 4,000 people. And I didn't inherit even a single shed. They left me nothing. There is nothing to leave. There is nothing. Like, how is it possible? So many generations, and I got nothing to my name. And I was thinking, I was like, this is mind-blowing, actually. How the hell? Well, because the 1% always detained the power, and they're working to maintain it, and they will work to maintain it 
and they will fight whatever battles they need to fight to maintain that power and control so that everybody else cannot afford to own property, cannot afford to be independent, cannot afford to build wealth for themselves and their future generations. Because the next generations, as it comes up, it has to start from zero. It's not allowed. It's not allowed to maintain wealth and to grow wealth from generation to generation. That is something that they will not let you do, Linda. They're not going to let you do it. So that simple video blew my mind. But here I am thinking now to myself, the only way to break out of these chains is to start not spending money. That little money that we earn, why do we have to give it back to them? Sell your soul to the company store, mofo. Why do we have to do that? If we stop spending, if we stop giving them our money, then we start winning. Gen Z, baby, you got the solution right in front of your noses. So stop doing that plastic surgery on those noses. Instead, invest that money in seeing clearly. Keep that money. Don't give it to them. Listen to me, Linda. Thank you for watching. Let me know your thoughts and prayers in this medieval times we are living in. Subscribe to my channel. <laughs> The devil is in the detail. Love you. Loads. Never give up on love. Bye.